So let's start by creating an app. We are going to create an app which will tweet mentioned specifically in the content that this is not for developers because if you are a developer, you already know how to make an app. This is for people who are not programmers. They are business people. They should be in a position to create applications. So how do we do it? So you go to Office 365, log in, go to all apps. In all apps, you will see power apps. When you click on power apps, typically it will take you to make.powerapps.com. In that, I'm going to create a new app. So let's create a new app. But because I want to connect to Twitter, I have to create a connection as well. So I go to connections, Twitter. Oh, but wait. As a developer, you wouldn't do all this, right? If you are a developer, what will you do? You will go to Twitter and say, what is the method Twitter has given me to manage the show and programmatically send a tweet? So if that was the case, what would you do? Wait. First, you have to log into Twitter and get something called an API key, which is a lengthy process. Developers know it, but as a user, you will get confused very soon. Why is that API key required? Never mind. But having that key is not enough. Now you need a programming tool or a programming and platform and a language. There are many of them. You'll have to choose one of them, learn it. Once you do that, then you'll have to write the code. And then after some trial and error, hopefully you will send your tweet. And this is probably the simplest scenario I'm talking about. Now compare this with what we are going to do now. What did I do? I went to office.com, logged in as Office 365, went to Power Apps. In Power Apps, I need to tell Power Apps that I want to talk to Twitter. So you create a new connection, and there are lots of them, 300 plus. So you search for Twitter and log in once, which I have already done. So this connection is lying there. Now we want to create an app. So you go to create and create a blank application. Very nice. You can choose two form factors. What does that mean? You should know this application is going to be used more on the phone or on a browser. The word mentioned there is tablet, but basically it means even a PC or a laptop or a Mac, which has a larger screen. In simple terms, it means it means the layout is vertical like this if it is phone or horizontal if it is tablet. But this decision has to be taken initially. Once you choose phone, then everything will be laid out as though everyone is going to use it on phone. If you see it on browser, it will still, still show it as though it was on a phone in a vertical layer. So in this case, I'm just going to choose tablet and say create. I have no understanding of what is an application, what to do, what to create. I just said create and let's see what happens. So it gives you some message saying, do you want to create a form? Do you want to create a gallery? Said, no, I don't want to do any of it. So remember, we went and did what? We said create a Canvas app. So what is that thing called Canvas? Canvas like you know, looks at a blank canvas. That's exactly what we are seeing here. This is a blank Canvas. And then it's up to you as to what you want to do with it. All right. So now what do we want to do with it? I want some message which I want to tweet. Now where is this tweet going to go? Obviously it is going to go on my Twitter. So let me show you my Twitter. This is my Twitter. If you want to test it out, you can see what is happening here. My ID is DR Nitin P. So these are some tweets I have done. Last one I did was 12 July. Now using this application, I'm going to tweet and as soon as I do that and I refresh this page, it should appear here. That's the idea. So now come back to our app. Now in our app, what is happening? There is nothing here. So first I need text which I want to tweet and then I'll have a button which says, okay, now use text and tweet it. Very good. So I need a text box. Look at this. This is the designer, so to say. 
on left side we have something right side we have something and in the middle we have something which looks like a slide actually so what this for apps is designed like it is like powerpoint there is a slide kind of thing in between and you can go and insert stuff like in powerpoint what do you have insert image insert video insert text box same thing so what do i want to insert text box so we'll put a text input so it gives me a text input okay let's increase the font size to whatever so the tweet text i am going to write here and then i want to submit or i want to say okay now you want this to be tweeted so we need a button so we put a button again you can resize it and beautify it the way you want but let's make it very simple right now all right so far so good let's make this also font size 30 so like in powerpoint we have shape properties similar to this if the part called shapes per se these are called controls because they allow you to control the user interface this is text input this is button like that all right so far very nice but now if i want to test is this working or not so typically in a programming language you have to run it you have to compile it here it's very simple you say preview the app we have not saved it yet we have not published it i just want to test whatever i have done does it work or not so now this is how it will look when people are using it so it's asking me for a text input i can change this and then click the button very nice so we just created an app which essentially does what nothing right now so why is it not doing anything because we have typing text we are clicking the button but when we click the button what is to be done we have not informed the application yet how do you do that so look at the button now when i click on the text box you see this is the selected item when i click on the button this is the selected item so on the left side you will see that we just created a blank screen and in that we have put a button and a text box okay so what can we do with it this is a text box so what you can do with the text box there is a drop down here what is it saying you can change the alignment border color this that lots of properties same properties are also seen here right format font size same thing we were seeing there there are some advanced properties also so now there is something called action same way there is a button properties which tells you what kind of button it is is it visible or not what is the color those kind of things it is trying to show us so if i want i can change font color border all kinds of things from here so now what the button should do is something which is an action so you go here you will see alignment border long scroll bar so what should the button do is called on select right now it is not doing anything it's saying i don't do anything ah so now we want to tell him to tweet but where is tweet as of now we have created a connection to twitter but that connection is not yet added here so this is data this is this what do we do data add data what do we do we have connections yes twitter yes so now it says okay you have a connection to twitter let me add it so this data thing is not just a database it is so now we have this connection so this connection is name is called twitter so now if i go to this look at the left side what do we have nowadays when you want to you click on those three paths there are two paths like that are both clear at the inside so the button menu 
So what is this preview? Preview means whatever is currently available. The application itself, in that application, we have a screen, we have a button, we have a text input. The second one is insert, which shows you the same things which are available in the insert menu on top. The third thing is the data and connections. And fourth thing is media, which is and there are some other things. So now let's go to the view. We are on the text input. No, or we want the button input. And on button, we want to tell this guy to tweet it. Now, how do we do that? Of course, you need to understand how the Twitter connection works. For that, you will have to understand some things. So you'll have to read up how a Twitter connection works. So let me tell you that. So there are lots of connections available or lots of connectors available. One of them is Twitter. So if I go to a documentation of a connector, what happens? I will give you this link. Don't worry about that. So if you go to a connection and copy the link, I will give you the link later on. And then we want to see how does this connector work? So I'm going to docs.microsoft.com connector reference. And then there are lots of connectors. And there is a long list of all kinds of connectors. So one of them is what? One of them is Twitter. So after you have understood what Twitter connector can do for you, then you can come and look at this. So the name of our connector here is Twitter. So if you type it here, notice it does understand what it is and it puts some things there. Twitter dot followers, Twitter dot following. So this has become enabled because we have added the connection. If the connection wasn't there, this would not work. So now we don't want to get followers. So I don't want to get my existing tweets. I want to tweet. So what is that? The syntax for that is Twitter dot tweet. So when I type T, it shows you all the things under Twitter which have the character T in it. So tweet means actually go and tweet it. Home timeline means what? Whatever I go and look at in my Twitter home, that is visible. There. If I want to retweet, that is what it will give me. So give me something. This is going to open. This is retweet. I already have something I want to retweet. This is an action. This is an action. This is going to retrieve data for me. All that is documented. Don't worry. So now we will say tweet. Now what should we want to tweet? Uh, so what do we want to do? Again, there is a syntax there. It's saying, are you attaching a file? No, I'm not attaching a file. So what do I do then? Nothing, empty file name. Then say, okay, now I want to give the tweet text. So what is it saying? Tweet text, color text. Now this is a particular syntax you have to understand. Tweet text is the name of the thing and the text is the actual text. And initially it may sound confusing, but it's like an Excel formula right now. So that's the syntax. Tweet text is the actual name of the field which we have to supply. And it has to Excuse be. Me? Yeah. Uh, the voice is breaking up in between. It's not clear. All right. Yeah. Okay, is the voice clearer now, Shisham? Yes, much better. Thank you. All right. So now what am I going to do? It's giving me a warning here saying invalid argument because I have not finished exactly what I was typing there. So now I have to continue typing this. So what am I trying to say? In the curly braces, what is it saying? Write the word tweet text. This is upper lowercase matters. Actually, at the bottom, it is giving you that. So you don't have to really type this complicated thing. Press down arrow and press tab. So now it's saying, OK, I got that. Now you have to actually supply the text. So right now, if you directly want to supply the text, you just put it in double quotes. So I'm going to say demo text. 
and this is actually going to get tweeted by the way, so my Twitter followers should not get confused, so I'll say testing. Please ignore. Now the quotes are complete, but this curly brace also has to be completed. And then what else has to be done? After Twitter.tweet, we have opened a bracket, so we have to close the bracket. Now, when I say enter, right? Control enter rather. Now this button knows what to do when I click on it. But notice I am clicking on it, but it's not doing anything. Why? Because we are in edit mode. Now, when I go to play mode and click on the button, what is it going to do? It is going to talk to the Twitter connection, is going to tweet without a file, tweet text equal to demo text testing. So if you really want to check it, go to my Twitter page and have a look. So let's see what is happening on the Twitter page. Here is the Twitter page, twitter.com dr Nitin P. Right now there is nothing, I will just refresh it. And now we will come back to our application, we'll run it. And right now, whatever I've written in the text box has no meaning because we have hard coded what to tweet. So let's click on the button and it's doing something. It actually talked to Twitter right now and let's refresh this. So notice it's that simple. So compare what I was trying to show you earlier. As a programmer, what would you have done? To recap, what would you have done? To make an app as a programmer, you would have done this, found the, got the Twitter API key, then went to a language, editor, edit it, test it, compile it, and then compare that to what we just did. So I hope this is clear. Now let's go one step further. So this was a test. Now what I want to do is, right now what we have done in the button is hard coded the text. We don't want to do that. What do we want to do? We want to see what is written here. That should be tweeted. So now who is this guy? The name of this button is text input one. You can rename it also. So ideally you should because soon what will happen in a real life situation, there'll be lots of button, lots of text input. So text input one, text input two, you will get confused. The same thing in PowerPoint, you add so many shapes and then become shape one, shape two, totally confusing. So best practice is as soon as you add something, whether it's a button, text input, whoever it is, it's immediately a good idea to give it a name. Now remember, there are lots of things, labels, buttons, text boxes, and so many things. Now if you just give it a name called tweet, then you will not know is it a tweet text or is it a button? So it's another good practice that it's a button. The name of that button cannot be just tweet. Although whatever name you give will work, we have to remember in the long run that this is a button. So button is the prefix which tells you what kind of control it is and then hyphen tweet now or whatever you want to give it. So bottom line, whatever is the type of control, a prefix of the type of control. So if this is a text box, we can just say text and we will see is that uppercase T, uppercase T is not really required, but it makes it more readable. So, so far so good. Now let's look at what happens here. What is this? This is a tweet text, txt tweet text is the name of this control. Now, whatever I type inside it, where does it go? Let's see. So if I open this, this has many properties. One property is border style, one property is color. Right? One property will be fill, one property is font, all kinds of things it has. Like that, if you go on scrolling, 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 right? It will have a property which tells me what is the value inside it. So there's another way here, right? What is the value right now? It's called default. 
text input, right? What is this? This is a default value. I don't want that. I want to say enter read text. So now anybody comes here, they will see the message called enter tweet text. Ah, OK. And then I go on and on and on like that. It has a property. What is that called? That property is itself called text. All right, so. Now I need to tell this button. Whatever is coming here cannot be a hard coded thing like this. I want the text which is typed here. How do I do that? I know the name of this guy, so I say tweet text txt. Notice it found out that there is a control we have, so click on it or down arrow and tab, and then you have to say not just this. What about it? It can have a color, it can have a font, so dot, and then it is again giving me a long list of options, one of which is the text. So now it is done. So what is this button going to do now? So I'm going to talk to Twitter, say I want to tweet, no file attached, and this is the text. Oh, by the way, we have not saved anything yet, so let's save. And this is Twitter demo, let's save. There is also an auto save function, but that's fine. So now let's come back. Now let's try it out, and at that stage, Let's see what is the state on our Twitter demo text. Come back and play it. So now this time I am going to tweet a longer one. Now let's click the button and see what happens. It will talk to Twitter internally, whatever it has to do, it will do. And what happens? This also gets tweeted. So that's uh, the life cycle of creating a simple application. Now, we are 30 minutes almost down the line. Shesham, do we have any questions pending? Yes, we do have one question which we can take up now. Yeah, what are sure. the advantages and disadvantages compared to other apps developed using some language or technology? Yeah, so. I think that is amply clear now. At what time did the question come? This came in at 3.15. Yeah, so I was trying to show you as a developer what will you have to do versus using Power Apps, how simple it was. So without being a developer, of course, you have to learn something. It's not absolutely dumbed down, but without having a programming language, without getting that API key, without having a language editor or visual studio or any other programming infrastructure you could get it done that's the benefit so the idea is very simple we are trying to create business apps without programming as much as possible and it's not programming per se we didn't do anything we did write functions we did learn how to put a button, how to put a text box, how to link the two together. So there is some knowledge acquisition and learning involved, but programming per se, traditionally what we call programming is not involved. That's what I mean. So it's simpler. I'm sure it is shown beyond doubt by now that it is simpler than even if you were a developer and we quickly wanted to do just this much, it's very compelling. Now we just created the application. What can we do with it? Let's see. We have saved this application, right? We just saved it. Now if you want to share it with people, you publish it and share it. Now you can share it with people in your company, users, owners, whatever. You can share it with people and uh, you can give the name of those people. And uh, let's say multiple people, you can put groups. And then you can share it and then they can also use that. Now make sure users have access to data used in the app gateways. So that connection which I used also they should have. Now if I wanted them to be just using it, I will just share it. 
if I wanted them to have the ability to edit and stuff like that, then I will make them co-owners. Now, of course, this Twitter handle is on my personal name, but in a corporate scenario, I would have a corporate Twitter handle. And Twitter is just one example. There are 300 different things you can connect to. So that's how you share it. Now, suppose you make some changes and then. What happens? So let's see that part. So this is done, so let's close it. Now let's go back to the app and edit it. Now I'm going to make few changes. Uh, probably it's already open somewhere. So let's edit. And uh, in the edit, which let's make some changes. So I'm just going to change some font color something just to say that you created an app, then some new changes came, new requirement popped up and then we made some other editing or enhancements to the app. Right now I have not made any particular enhancement just to do something visually. Let's add something else. Now remember if this was a mobile app, exactly the same situation. The only difference would be it would be vertical layout. Everything else remains the same. So we have seen just button and text. If I wanted a caption, for example, this is a caption. So caption is what a sort of a title. And this is not editable, it's just a display. So same thing like in terms of formatting. And this is a caption like that, button, caption. Label, which is what we just did. HTML text, if you want people to edit, rich text means bold, italic, underline, highlight, those kind of things. And if it was a tablet or a laptop with a stylus or even mobiles have stylus, you can even accept pen input. Very useful for scribbling or signatures and stuff like that, or even for sketching. There is something which people are actually looking at and sketching, that kind of thing as well works beautifully. Is the audio clear, Shesham? Yes, the audio is clear and we do have a few questions lined up. Yeah, just immediately after this remind me after I sure. finish the insert menu. Now there is another very important thing called gallery. We need to understand. What is gallery? What is data table? So gallery is a collection of things. Right now I type something and it went away into tweet. I have not saved it anywhere, but suppose I want to get my tweets. Ah, then what do I do about it? Sure, so now I have to store them somewhere and show it somewhere. So either I can show it in gallery or data table. Gallery comes in this format. Data table is a simple table, so let's do that. Now I'm going to just to make things simpler. I'm going to create a new screen as this I don't want to disturb. So this is a new screen. You can have a blank screen. You see everywhere we have lots of options. You're not going to go into each one of them, but just to go through a simple list. Success means. After clicking the button, I could have checked whether Twitter gave me an error and there is a event called on success. I wanted to show a message clearly that tweet was successfully posted. That's a ready made screen for that. Tutorials type of screen where you have a picture and instructions. This is for getting you Outlook users. There are some pre made templates. People again, Office 365 users, meeting details, calendar, or just pure split screen, which has two areas and you populate it with whatever you want. So this two halves. Three layout, three layout, one on top of each other. Portrait, landscape, those kind of things are going on here. No problem. Now what happens is this. Let's create a new simple blank screen. And here I want to put a data table. OK, now it's saying OK data table. What do you want to show in the table? Do you want to type it or you want to get it from somewhere? So the moment I add a data table, it says, yeah, get it from Twitter. Now the moment I add Twitter, notice what it is doing. It is saying 
there is an error. So whenever you see an error like this, hover on that button saying name is not valid. So what name is not valid? So whatever I have asked this guy to do is not valid. That is what it is asking me to do. So what do I get to now? I need to know again the syntax home timeline means what? Whatever I see on my home timeline, show me that. That's what I'm asking it to do. OK, so that seems to have worked. And now it is saying no more error saying, oh, whatever you have written there, uh, you can see it now. No problem. You can use it also. And then what? Then, but still it is saying choose the fields. Means what? Choose the fields means what? Choose the field means it has got the data already. It is asking you what to put there. So when I click on this, notice this is screen two data table. Let's rename it. Let's call it data table. OK, now on the right side on property, it's saying data source we have already got. What do you want to show? And now it is saying add fields. Now notice all these have come from Peter already. Ah, so it's saying OK on my home screen. What is the tweet ID? Who has tweeted it and the tweet text? That is what I want to see. OK, so that's it. We actually got a live thing coming from my home screen. Very, very useful. So this is how we can start developing the functionality. So this is about data table. Something similar. So table is like a table rows and columns columns. Now if I go to the table, notice where I'm clicking. These are columns. This is the actual data table. This is called edit fields. Now this can become very lengthy, so click on this three dots. Three dots is like right click, say collapse all. So we know we are showing three fields from here. Very good. Now on those three fields, I want to rearrange them. What do I do? You can just rearrange. So I want the person name. I don't want the tweet ID. No problem. Remove. I just want the tweet text. That's also fine. I want to add a field. Sure, no problem. Now, whatever is available here, we can go and add. So let's say retweet count. Add. So now it will have got added directly here. So this is how you control what is the content of this. So data table and gallery are similar in that sense. They are a container and in that you choose the fields. The fields are chosen and edited from here. All right. Now suppose the tweet count. What is it saying? The control type. Control type means what? It's a text column. What else can I do with it? Nothing. Tweet text. What is it? It's a text column. Can I do anything with it? No. Tweeted by. It's a text column. I, nothing much I can do, but I will show you later. Depending on the type of control, you can change different things. Now gallery, we will see a little later. Then we have forms, proper forms, which has edit form or a display form, which we'll see later. But very interesting because this is mobile driven. All the capabilities of your mobile are directly available here. For example, camera, a barcode scanner, which is also going to use the mobile or tablet or laptop camera for that matter. You can insert video. Stream is for getting and displaying videos from Microsoft Stream, which is a streaming server, which is a part of Office 365. Normal audio, play audio files or capture audio from the mobile or laptop microphone and then save it if required. Add a picture which will give you a dialogue saying insert picture and choose the picture either from mobile phone gallery or from desktop laptop or even from camera. Then import export is what? Whatever this data is, if you want to locally import and export, there is a PDF viewer which is currently experimental, so I will not talk about it. Experimental means new features which are coming up. 
but generally new features which are coming up are called preview. Experimental means it may or may not land up as a final feature. They may not even do it. So generally you don't. Map, you can have Bing Maps inserted and capture location and stuff like that. And there is VR, virtual reality also. So if you have a VR application and the correct infrastructure goggles or whatever, VR headphones, you can include that also as a part of this. Now notice as a developer to do this, different programming is required, different programming, different programming, different programming. Here in one drop down, we are getting all those capabilities without understanding anything about programming. That is the real, real, real power. Also, we have charts, simple charts, not as powerful as Excel or Power BI, but you can actually get a Power BI tile from a Power BI dashboard, which in turn can have all the sophistication of Power BI, and then that gives you best of both worlds also. Now, very often when we are creating applications, we are creating user interface, so you need some icons for common stuff, buttons, so lots of them. And then there is something in AI and mixed reality. AI we will see a little later, mixed reality we are not going to see today. So now we have understood how to create a simple app, how to add a screen, how to add a connection, what to add inside screens, and how to connect those together, how to publish, and how to manage the show. So again, let's take a pause and take questions. So the first question is, where are these apps going to be stored? Yeah, so everything is stored in Microsoft Cloud as a part of Office 365. But when you say these are mobile apps, what do I exactly mean? That's important to understand. So let me explain. When you go to Office 365, what do you get? We get lots of products. One of them is Power Apps. So these are the products you get as a part of Office 365. If it's Microsoft 365, you get Windows plus security. So Power Apps, Power Automate, Power BI, you know the story. Now, where do these apps run? Word, Excel, PowerPoint run on desktop, browser, mobile. Sway and Forms run only on browser. Power Automate runs on browser and on desktop and on mobile. Power App runs on browser and mobile. So if you really look at it, all these apps are available on the mobile as well, except for Sway and Forms, which are purely browser based. So what you need to do now for deploying and using these apps on mobile, you don't have to go and create an Android app separately and an iOS app separately and a Windows app and a Mac app separately. What do you do? You create a mobile app in Power Apps, like I said, but how will your users consume or use that app on their mobile phones? All that you have to do is install the Power Apps app on their mobile. Now, when you install the Power Apps app, that's an infrastructure under which all your mobile apps are going to run. So what happens next? I've installed my Power Apps app. So as I said, creation of Power Apps happens purely on browser. There is no desktop version of it. I showed you how to do it. Go to all apps, Power Apps and do it. But the consumption can happen on full desktop, Mac or laptop or a tablet. Now here it could be Mac or Windows here. It could be my, uh, typically Mac tablets or Android tablets. So this is the mobile play. Now if I go to App Store of iOS or Android, am I going to see my Twitter app which we just created? No, I'm not going to see that. So what am I going to see then? I go to Power Apps, install Power Apps on my mobile and then I get the infrastructure of running any Power App which is shared with me. And now when I go here, this is one of the apps I created yesterday for Twitter. Now I can create not one, hundreds of apps there 
and under the umbrella of this power apps, they are going to run. So in this case, the app is stored on the mobile of the user. So that's how you get an idea. You go to power apps, develop the app, share it with people. They already have power apps installed on their mobile and they can just see it instantly. All that they have to do is refresh this list. So that is another very significant benefit from ideation to rollout is extremely fast, which cannot happen in a typical mobile or even desktop application development lifecycle scenario. All right, any other question? Where and how do we learn the syntax required for the function specified? Yeah, sure, I will explain that later. Any other question? Yes, can we create an app and make it available for the entire organization? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, how do we share this app with a personal account connection? Hello, I don't understand what is personal account, so whoever has posted that question, can you post some more details? A more detailed question and then I will answer it. Yeah, Anything and how else? do we make how do we make the application available to the users within the organization? Yeah, I showed you the share functionality. There is another way of doing it through Teams, which I will show you shortly. OK, what is the USP of Microsoft Power Apps over available contemporary low code applications? I think that we should take at the end and hopefully I will have explained that so that the question is answered at the, by the end of the session. Anything else? How would you use a Power App created? Do we need to always go in the Power App page? Yes, you will have to go to Power Apps page, favorite the app and start from there if you're on browser. If you're on mobile, I've already shown that. And in mobile, you can have hundreds of apps coming from your organization. You can swipe it left side and put it as favorites, which is what I've done here. OK, now. Any more questions? Yes, there are a few. Would you like to take it up now? We will show more and then I will pause and take again. OK, so bottom line. Let's go further. We have a lot to cover. So bottom line, I think we have seen how this part is done. Let's go further. I showed you there is something called Canvas app, which we started from blank. There's another one called model driven app, which starts with a sort of a database, which I will explain very soon. And then there is a portal, which is like an intranet or extranet with programmable functionality. It's like a mobile or it's a website we are creating, but it's not a read only website. It is not a typical intranet. It's a functional business automation website. We are not going to cover portals in today's session. So what we just did is a canvas app. It's user focused. You have full control or whatever you want to do in the app. As we have seen, every small little component of every control is fully manageable and customizable. That's user focused. You start with a blank canvas, text picture list, easy to create. Now in an app, just to look at broadly, we have data. In this case, the data came from Twitter. Now we'll see another example. Then user interface, the button and text box, and then actions. We just saw all this in action. But rarely are you going to create a business application which tweets. So let's see really where does the data come from? So of course we have a lot of choices there. As I said, the most common in Office 365 contexts are SharePoint. Excel, SQL Server, and common data services, which is now called Dataverse. Of course, as I said, it is not limited to Microsoft. There are 300 plus other things. But here to understand the difference between a data source and a connection. Twitter is a connection. Although it does provide me data, in the true sense of the word, it's not a data source. It does give me data which I have to figure out and it also gives me some actions, but a proper database has tables, relationships. It allows me to have specific commands for adding, updating and so on and so forth. So from that point of view, if you look at table connectors, those who understand what is a table, a database contains a table. So what are those kind of things? So if you see 
these are table connectors means they understand the concept of a table kind of situation so obviously they are not only microsoft connectors sql server is microsoft data versus microsoft sharepoint is microsoft but there are all other common databases as well another thing excel files stored on cloud storage also can be a data source so not just one drive google drive dropbox box as well similarly what in in these boxes or cloud excel online or google sheets they can be data sources then there are business applications erp kind of things which are dynamics of microsoft or third party ones salesforce maybe market or these are software as a service kind of applications all of them are valid data sources so let's see how can you use one of these data sources and make some sense out of it now it may be very compelling when you go and look at the data sources to go and do something in the context of excel because when you go here one is sharepoint one is excel blank app which is what we did everything we did from scratch but if you don't want to start from scratch you already have data it's very compelling to use something this which is fine and then when you click on other data sources you will get that long list so you can say new connection and we are back to what we showed you earlier but before that amongst these two which one sounds most popular most people are going to tend to excel because that's more natural to us than sharepoint but let me tell you please do not use excel as a data source even though it is available and there is not just because i don't like excel of course i like excel anybody who knows me cannot say i don't like excel as a product it's an amazing product but not a good thing as a data source that's the point so why not data source i'm not going to go into details but these are the problems some of them i will explain some of them i will not because they are complex so data source as excel works only from one drive not from sharepoint which is a problem because on one person's one drive it has to be excel tables which is fine but those tables cannot have formulas which is a bad idea because very often we have formulas in tables and the file in excel must not be opened by someone that's the problem in excel file you can't guarantee that when the app is being used file is closed so that's a big problem and it does not detect data types which is probably the most important part when you add the data source it doesn't know is it a number or a text and you have very little control over it so it's a bad idea don't use excel so what do you use then the best thing to use to learn this is sharepoint but sharepoint is again a vast topic so within sharepoint what do you use and fortunately we have something extremely simple and powerful in sharepoint called lists that is your best place to go to to start learning power apps i have conducted a separate session on lists session will give you the link to that video in this q and a panel uh, so i have a list just quickly what do you do in a list it's like a table you create a new list you start with a blank list i will just create a simple list right now and uh, what do i do in a list create it and simply add columns even this is better than excel why because when you add columns in excel technically there are word uh, text dates and numbers here we have so many different options so you add a column give it a name you can make it mandatory and so on and so forth very very powerful you can share it with people and when you share it with people you can tell them to edit or view and if you share it with multiple people by going here to list settings and advanced and just two more clicks people can now edit data completely independent of each other but you will get data in one place excel is not capable of doing this in a secure way we just said people can read and edit only the items they have added which is outstanding capability commonly not used this is not new this is available for 15 years 
That's why I'm saying it's an amazing tool. Please use it. So I already have a list here called data entry. How do we create a app to capture data like this? Of course, the data entry list itself by on its own gives you a method. So this is a list. I have a product packaging quantity status date modified by. And if I want, I can add more columns. So there is a new button. It does give you this kind of form, but this kind of form may not be intuitive and you may want to change some things. That customization can be done in Power Apps. But many people like to edit it like or enter data like Excel. In that case, there is a grid view here. If you just want Excel like data entry, create a list, teach people one click here called grid view and you're done. But if you want to do it properly in an app form with let's say camera integration and audio and scanning all the capabilities of power apps we saw then you have to do it in power apps so how do we go about doing it in power apps again multiple methods so i'll show you two methods now notice this is the list so where is this list list data entry so i'm just going to copy this link because we'll need it now i go to power apps and i say create an app from SharePoint. Share list is basically SharePoint. Now it will give you a list, but it's simpler to just copy paste the URL and say go. So now what will it do? This is the data entry list which we just talked about. Now you say connect. Now it will do a lot of background work for you behind the scenes and let's see what it does. So what did it do just now? It created an app for us in just few seconds and it says, do you want to see what I just did? So let's do that actually. Remember in our list, what do we have? One product packaging quantity status date modified by comes automatically depending on who edited that record. Now with that, what is it saying? Do you want to see your app? So now it's actually running that app. Notice it created this app. The name is here. What's saying? Refresh. Oh, what does that mean? So if I go to my data entry list now and using the list itself, I type something and then I do status shift date will put 31st. If I want to, I can add attachments. Now if I come back to the app and refresh, that PPV came here. So it already did all that. Then I can sort from here. Oh, ascending, descending. This plus sign is actually to create a new item. Notice we have not gone in the app and said this is a text box. That is a date. Nothing. We just clicked on that button and it has done this for us. Created a form. Now when I created this list, this is a very powerful feature which is impossible to implement in Excel. What have I said here? When I am having these columns. When you edit a column in those column settings, we can actually say require that this column contains information. In simple terms, it's a mandatory column. So this column is mandatory. Title column is mandatory. So this app actually picked up that information from SharePoint and it has made these things mandatory. So if I let's say put something which is mandatory and forget to do it, it is not going to accept it. So it's not just put text boxes there. It has also put the validation automatically. So behind the scenes, lots of work has actually happened. Right. So let's put something here. And just to make sure. Let's put CCC and quantity 444. Let's actually see if it works. We can even attach files. Now we say submit item and it's back. So has it added the item? Has it added the item? You don't know. Has it added? Has it added? Let's go to our list and see by refreshing it. See, these are the items which we just added. So done, it's working. So now let's see behind the scenes. What has it done? By the way, 
This is just a preview. This is new. This is refresh. This is sort. What is this? This is view item, so it actually shows you a read only version of that particular row and this pencil actually allows you to edit something. So the first record I was going to say BBB and change it. And of course, instead of 44, I changed to 888 and save. Go back to our list and see what happened. Let's sort it A to Z. So that's also done. So this, how does it work? So let's come back and actually understand the anatomy of what happened. First thing is we clicked on the list earlier. So data, there is a connection automatically created. We could have done this manually separately, but it did it. Then in this tree view control, we have three screens created. The browse screen, which comes as the first screen by default. It also created an app, by the way. The app itself is the whole application under that three screens. So the app itself on start, it says on the application start what to do, and it has its own events and actions and stuff like that. In that we have browse screen and uh, detail screen, which we just saw, and the edit screen, which comes when we click on this. So let's see what happens in browse screen. This which I'm showing you here is called a gallery. This is called a gallery. Notice it has multiple records and this is real data which is coming in edit mode. So this is called a gallery. In the gallery we have multiple things here. We have body, arrow, separator, subtitle and title. Where are these things coming from? These are coming from SharePoint. So this is a concept of a gallery which we need to understand. So let me add a new screen and explain what gallery is. So I'm going to add a blank screen and say I want to add a gallery, vertical gallery. Again, it says I need data. So we choose this data and like we did for tables, it's similar, but in tables is rows and columns. Here it is records one after another. So we have chosen that list as the data source. Now when we edit it, it actually allows you to see what do you want to show here. By default, this gallery had three things in it, image, title and subtitle. That's why it is showing image, sorry, body, subtitle, title and so many other things. So these are a part of this gallery. Now, of course, I don't want the image. So I can go here and notice I can just delete it. Now this is title, subtitle, whatever. I delete it. I delete it. Ah, okay. Then I say edit. Now I want to design exactly what I want to show here. I still have the data. I can say edit and map fields, but how do I do that? For example, in our thing here, we have some something called product. How do we do that? So product, the word product also I want to show and the contents of the product also I want to show. So when you are editing a gallery, what do we do? This is our gallery which I just created. Notice there is an edit button here. Now I want to put a caption there. Caption means what? The word title I want to show there. So what do I do? This is the size it is occupying. So caption is a label. Now if I put a label here and call it product, that is not going to work because there are multiple products. There are multiple records with it was it is trying to show the records. The word product came only once. So when you click on a gallery, notice there is an edit button. Whatever you want to do inside the gallery, click the edit button and do it there. So now this first record which is visible in the gallery is like a template. So notice if I increase the size of it, it's affecting the gallery. So this label has no meaning. It's outside the gallery. So now when it's in edit mode inside the gallery, I want to put a label. Ah, so now it just put a label and it automatically mapped it to something called what? The product name because that happens to be the first one. So if I want to edit that, you go to edit. Notice it has mapped it to the first column. Suppose I wanted to map it to modified by. 
I could have just changed it here. So like that, I can actually choose the control, which in this case is a label, and I can choose which of my data comes. So if I wanted to show packaging here, it's showing that like that. So that is how I manage. So in this case, I want to use the title. Then I want to put one more here and let's put one more label. How? Click on the gallery. My best way is from here. Edit, add a label, another one. Now what are these two doing? This label again is probably mapping to the same thing. So what is it saying? Title, packaging. I want to show quantity here, maybe. no problem. Like that, within this, you are creating a form and that's what it has done here in the browse screen. So if you go to the browse screen, this is a gallery and in that it has this, which is a label. It has this, which is also a label. It has this, which is also a label. Why all are labels? Because it's a view form. Now if I go to the edit screen, notice what has changed. Everything has changed. This is not a gallery any longer. Here I have Again, edited this gallery, but this is a form. So that's another concept. If you want to show one record at a time, you don't use a gallery or data table, you use a form. So this is a form. So if you look at it, edit screen is the whole screen. Inside that, this is a form. Whereas browse screen is also a screen, but inside the screen, we have a gallery. So in this form, now you add this stuff. Again, like we saw earlier, title comes and quantity comes and so on. Now I was trying to show you something else earlier. Quantity is shown as what? Edit number. But because it's a numeric field, now notice it's saying, do you want to edit it as a number or edit it as a slider? Ah, so multiple types of controls can now be mapped to that. So now you can actually change it like a slider. Now, of course, I can't change it here because I'm in edit mode, but if I press Alt, it is like running. Notice, instead of clicking on the preview button, if I quickly want to check something locally, I press Alt and run it. So now it is going to actually enter the quantity 76 using a slider, or maybe it was a numeric field and I wanted to show it as a rating. Okay, it could have now, given me this and internally the actual value of 2345 would have gone. So that's the flexibility. If I wanted that to be allowed values, I could have put a list and so on and so forth. So it gives you full control over exactly how the user interface is created. And that's the benefit of using Power Apps as an adjunct to create better applications which are still having underlying simple SharePoint list. All right, so let's go further. So now you understand what I mean by using data as a backend, user interface, and then actions. Actions means what? What is it doing when I click the submit button? I added something. When I click this, it has to put the data in. So this is a function, submit form, edit form. What to do, how to talk to a SharePoint, it knows and it does behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about it. Similarly, in this browse screen, when I say refresh data, what is it doing? It's saying refresh data entry. Who is data entry? Data entry is the name of our connection. So the best way to learn how this was done is create an app from a simplistic data source, dissect it behind the scenes and then learn the syntax. That's the best way. If you start from scratch, it will become too complex. All right. Any questions? Any questions relevant to this? One or two I'll take right now. Okay. So now, now that you have got the concept clear, I will show you some things slightly faster because there is another type of app called model app. What we did just now is we went and started from scratch, connected to data, 
data came from all kinds of places. We know that, but there is a special kind of database which is a part of this platform that creates more focused business oriented applications, not just any data business data. So that those are called model driven apps. So what are model? What is model data model? So it requires a proper database. All of us know what a database is, even if you are not a developer. Generally we know. What is a database in very simple terms? Database contains tables. Table is like an Excel table. Multiple tables put together is a database. But database also has been there for I don't know 50 years or 100 years ever since IT is there. Nothing new, but database from a maintenance point of view has a lot of issues. So we have something called data boss now. This is a term I have coined. There is no such term technically. What is data boss? All the disadvantages of database are taken care of without you knowing all the complexity of database management. And that data boss in simple terms is called a data verse. So where is this thing? For example, to give you a simple thing, I could have created a SharePoint list, Excel, SQL Server, or Amazon or XYZ. Now I need to know where is that Amazon? Do I have a connection? Where is that database? Has anyone created a similar table? Is there duplication? So we are back to what kind of chaos we do in Excel. So I created a table containing something and then realized that 100 other people in the organization need access to that. And then someone says, no, no, no. That numeric field which you created actually should be a currency field. And then I make it a currency and then say, no, that should be a multi currency field. It's all chaotic in the long run from a maintenance point of view. So a lot of thought has gone into going beyond just creating databases. So where is that thing called data verse? So when you go to make dot power point uh, power apps, we create apps simply from here or you go to model driven apps and then you go there. But wait before you have something called tables. This is the real stuff. This is called data boss or data verse. Data verse is the technical name now. Earlier it was called common data services. So what does this have? This actually has sample data. I will show you how to put that sample data so you can actually play with it. This is not just names of things. These are common business entities people use worldwide. Of course, I can create my own table. So suppose I want to create a social media calendar. So I say media calendar. This I could have done in a list also. This I could have done in Excel, Access, SQL Server. 100 other places, but I'm doing it here. So it creates a name for it. It is a display name. So display name by itself is media calendar. If I want, I can change it. Now create. What does it do now? The moment I create it, it says, OK, do you want to add columns? We can add columns to it. Add column and say type means is it LinkedIn post or Twitter or YouTube if I want it to. Now look at the types of data. These are even more than what you get in SharePoint in a list. 100 times more than what you get in Excel. But they're not just SharePoint data types. Notice text, text area, URL, ticker symbol. Suddenly these are highly business oriented things. We even have a time zone which is very important in multi country applications. We have choice choices specific currency field which understands how to do intercurrency conversion. You can set global points for global rates and so on. So lots of more sophisticated stuff. It also understands whether this needs to be rolled up or not. Like that I create columns. So just to save time, I'm going to go back to tables and show you some table which is already there. This is an accounts table with sample data. Now when I do that in the it has lots of columns. These are the columns. 
these are all pre-populated. So if you actually want to see the data, you can see it. But more importantly, these are my customers. Customers are related to business unit. Customers are related to my account manager, owning team. I have some business rules. I have some views. How do you look at customers data? There are so many columns I may want to see in different ways. So active accounts will filter it only on those which are alike, not those which are blacklisted or they no longer are active customers. Like that, these are pre-created views. If I want to edit a customer account, these are account forms which I have pre-created. There are dashboards, there are cards. Suddenly, it's not just rows and columns and data type. So this is called Dataverse. And these kind of applications can be created which are more structured and more resilient in the long run. So how do we create these applications? Go to the model type of data. So you go to make.powerapps.com, create model driven app. We'll go to the modern app designer, create a name and go through it. But the easiest way to learn this and I wanted to show that part also. So here you create a new page, add data. That's one way of doing it. But now in this data worst thing, data worst is a paid service, but recently Microsoft gave a mini version of data worst for free inside Teams. All this is now available inside Teams. So let me quickly show you how to do it in Teams and then we will close and then we will take questions. So how do we do that? We go to Teams, of course. And in Teams, no chat, we go to Teams, Teams. Create a team, I have already created a team. Now on the left side of Teams, normally what do you see? Teams calendar calls. If you click on the three dots again, you will see Power Apps. So this is how you add it. So if I click here, I will see Power Apps here also 300 plus. Things integrate with this. So Power Apps. To make sure it stays there, you pin it. First time it will take a little while. You say start now. So we create a mini version of the data verse for you. Whatever I just showed you. And now you can start creating apps within within what within teams. So create an app. It's saying which team do you want to put it in? So I have created a team for power apps. Demo. OK, so it's getting things ready. Now it's creating an app. Notice on the left side, what is it saying? There is teams already because we are in teams so that context is already there. OK, so now with data, fine. We don't have anything to work with. So of course you can go to Dataverse, see all tables. Notice multiple tables which we had talked about earlier, including the table I showed you earlier, accounts and all that, but I want to create a new one. So let's say social media calendar. So here it is a simpler experience. This is name. I want to edit the column, no problem. I'm saying category. Or I will call it title because I'm creating something in social media. There are some more options. That's fine. Now, new column. What type of social media post this is? The choice. Notice that data types are less than data was because this is a free version of data. So I want to create a LinkedIn post. So I am just adding this as we go along. Create and just one more column and then we are ready to go. And of course I will need a date when I want to post it. So we choose a date. Create close. So now it's adding the table. It will create the user interface. Notice it added a screen. 
it created a container it has created a ui ui for new record all that is done and now you say publish save of course first and then say publish to teams so this is structured data with all the benefits of data was coming into picture so it's asking me where to publish it i say save and close and it's done so now if i go back to my teams the power app teams general tab very soon something else will appear here which will show me that app as well so this was an app i created yesterday to just demonstrate because it takes a little while for it to refresh in teams anyway if i go to power apps and let's say publish yeah so once it is published after a few minutes it will appear all the team members will see it you can even share it outside teams so this is how the integration across the platform works so now you have got a better picture let's see exactly how are you going to go about doing there's of course a lot of ai component but it's too early to do right now just notice that with few clicks you can actually have forms processing you can have object detection automatic training of ai models without knowing any ai programming that is all you need to know at this stage so what do you need to do actually you go to a browser and then you search for power automate just check whether you have access to it in your office 365 if not ask your it to give you access by default everyone has free version of power apps so now you go to power apps community plan now it will take you there community plan is a developer plan which is always free so you go there register and then it will add a development environment to your app so what is an environment it's a container where you can create apps that's all generally the first place where people use it is for testing and learning but you can have live environment also so there's a test environment separate live separate you can have separate environments for departments branches companies like that so what is that environment thing let me show you so whatever i was doing so far in power apps you have seen i have gone to multiple places in power apps when you go to power apps the default is make.powerapps.com here you will see environment so this is my organizational environment but i am playing around and learning in that dev environment so that's what you should do shesham can you be on mute so uh yeah. this is where you choose is audio clear yes audio is fine so this is where you should play around this is an environment now you need sample data so i'll show you how to get the sample data so you click on the wheel in the environment then go to this is an environment first make a developer environment and then go there sorry i clicked the wrong button go to admin center in that admin center you will see all the environments click on the dev environment then go to settings in those settings you will see lots of options go to data management click on sample data and it will tell you that sample data is either there or not by default it is not there it will take a little while to add it if you have already added it of course you can remove it but in the first time you go it will say give me some time to add then you will get all the tables with relationships pre populated data which is extremely useful for learning so that's how you go about doing it so add the sample data then you are good to go so what do you do get this done there are sample apps also available out of the box without adding the sample data also you get some base sample apps outside itself so if you go to make.powerapps.com you will get some sample apps below as well so you can learn from there there is a learn button right there 
which has guided learning, which has very popular learning paths. Follow them. It is step by step process and really useful. Then there are lots of video channels which are MVPs of Power Apps, which are doing really good job. Reza Red is one of them. I will give you a link in the deliverables. So who are the great MVPs on Power Apps for doing a lot of in-depth work? But the most important part, having done and you have learned, is applying that learning. Don't just get into details of the syntax and go deeper, because finally we have to make some use out of it. So all this was OK. Now you have to come back to basics. What are we trying to do? Create business apps. Now I am sure it's fairly clear why is it better or more easy than a typical development environment in terms of comparison with other low code applications. I'm not going to go and do a syntax based comparison. Even if that comparison is done, the most important part is Power Apps doesn't sit alone as an environment. Every aspect of all other Microsoft tools is available to it out of the box, which includes everything in Microsoft platform and no other low code, no code platform has this breadth of integration. Having said that, it also integrates with 300 plus outside applications. You can even create custom connectors and integrate with your line of business apps. Where do you create it on browser? Where do you use it? Browser, mobile, tablet. How using Power Automate? When and why? Those are the important things. Why is the most important? In order to improve something which is already happening or to improve it or doing something new which you are not capable of doing. So that's what is the call to action? Once you get the nitty gritty and how to create all that done, you have to map it to business context. So learn, fine, but more importantly, while you are learning everything, think where is it going to add value to me in my day to day context? And this is typically missed. That's the problem. So remember, just because it's fashionable, don't use it. It has to do one of the two things. Either it has to improve something dramatically than what is happening today, or it has to give you a new useful capability. That is what I mean by mapping. Once you have that thought, then do a quick test, validate it, then quantify the benefits and beneficiaries. What does that mean? Benefits means business benefits, time saving, quality improvement, simplicity, whatever. Beneficiaries means who are the people who are going to benefit and how many of them. And then you can quantify the business impact. Then you have to check licensing because there may be some cost associated with it. I will tell you what that part is. Then implement it as a pilot, then refine it and then create training material. Don't just deploy it and send people a link saying use it. To create some nice training material for it, then deploy it and then use it. So licensing wise, all whatever I showed, a lot of it is free, but if you want to go into production, you must understand the licensing. I don't understand licensing, but there are different types of licenses available. The good news is on October 1st, whatever was $10 is going to become $5 and whatever was 40 per month is going to become 20. AI requires a costlier thing, but generally it is all bought at an organizational level, but developer is free. So in a couple of months, learn it, try it out and get ready to use it in real life. So let's get started on the question and answer. OK, the next question is, can we connect our Google sites to Power Apps? No. OK, how do we trigger mail on button? How do you trigger mail on button? So you click on the button. There's a button. Thing you have to connect to Office 365. So, like I said, multiple things are available as connectors. One of them is Office 365 itself. So, let me try to show it to you. So, when you go to Office 365 for apps connectors, 
OK, the next question is, are there tools using which we can use the app to receive input from the user? No, repeat the question, please. Are there tools using which we can use? To re receive the app input from the user. Yeah, everything which I'm showing is receiving the input from the user by creating the application. You publish the application when the user is running it on their mobile and then they go and say actually accepting the input from user. Next. Can we deploy sign in or sign up options using Power Apps? Yes, absolutely. When the or app, app on mobile, they will have to sign in. It's a part of the game. And use a single sign on. You can take it to other you may have in the environment as well. Absolutely. You can't use power app. There's a lot of Next. voice disturbance coming in. The I know. What can I do? I know. I can't help it. Can we create surveys using Power Apps and store data in SharePoint list or library? Yes. So okay. the, list basically. the next one is how does Power App differ from MS Flow? OK, I'm going to switch the microphone and see if the noise level is lesser there. OK. Yeah. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Is it better? Yes. OK, good. Can we schedule tweets, repeats, periodic? Yeah, so if you want to do anything unattended, then you don't use Power Apps because Power Apps is an app. It requires a human to press a button or put something. If you want to do something automated, yes, what you said can be done, but using Power Automate. So all these 300 connectors by and large work with Power Platform means they work with Power Automate as well as Power Apps. How do you uh, how do you have a list or input validation done when inputting text? Yeah, so whenever there is a text box. On the text box there is there are a lot of events available. So for example, you wanted something. This is an optional thing, but you wanted it to be mandatory. That's one kind of validation. So what do you do? You go here and you make it as required. Required is false, you make it true. Or you go to the advanced tab, unlock the properties, and here you make required equal to true, like that. So similarly, there are lots of con constraints which can be put, either using functions or using user interface to do validations. Validations can also be cross link. For example, only if the packaging is paper box, then shipping is allowed, something like that. So cross functionality. Finally, it comes to knowing the name of the control and then going to the properties of the control and linking them to another control at a very generic level. Next. Can we change the layout or environment post app creation that is on mobile app or PC app? So the model apps are dynamic in the sense they are responsive. They will work beautifully whether you put it on tablet or desktop or mobile. In case of canvas apps, you have to choose at the beginning. Whether it's going to be a mobile layout or open ended desktop layout. Desktop means tablet also. Once you create it, then create making them responsible is technically possible, but it's not automatic. Extra effort is involved. So if it's a canvas app, choose before model apps are dynamic. In other programming languages, we are defining local and global variables. Can we define yes. and use a local or a global variable in Power Apps? If yes, yes how? Yeah. Absolutely. Global variables are basically data. They have to be stored somewhere. Local variables are of course available internally. In fact, all these objects are variables. Just give me a minute. Yeah. Yeah, next. Is custom encryption or decryption possible? That's again a fire part of. A third party thing, so if you want encryption. Then you have to use Azure services, 
which will give you encryption API access. So that will have to be done through API access and that may require a little bit of programming. OK, but can, we connect, can we connect SQL on premise DB and storing data in restricted environment? Yes, if you have a database on premise, absolutely that is possible. And if you want to, this is all running on cloud. Your data is on premise. You need a data gateway which can talk to your local database and manage the show. Absolutely possible. So if you go to data, there are gateways for connecting to on premise data sources. OK, can we integrate dashboards created in Power BI and create a single power app? Can we white label the same? Yes, answer to both is yes. So you can add a Power BI tile into. Power apps as I was showing you is just an insert thing or you can add a power apps UI inside a Power BI dashboard as well. Both ways is possible. Just give me a second. I'll be back. Ah, oh, sorry. Tell me next. How the non 365 user can make use of the shared apps? They can't. OK, can they need we at least a free version of our apps access. Can we create an approval workflow and integrate with an AD? Absolutely, so when you are talking about uh, workflows, it is a connection finally. So if you go to connections, new connection and search, there is approvals which is shared actually uh, across uh, power apps and power automate absolutely whatever we have seen in power automate in terms of approvals is absolutely available so when you click on a submit button that item whether it is a file or a record like we added goes for approval through a process which you have defined in the approvals part of power automate possible in fact not possible it is designed to be like that next is it possible to code without a zero coding so zero code is a myth as you must have realized that uh, it is not really coding in the sense line one line two line three like that so in that sense yes fairly serious applications can be done but if you really want to do enterprise level, some amount of coding is available, but without much programming in the traditional sense of the word, a lot of it can be achieved. And for complexity of the syntax, so someone was asking me the syntax is called power FX. All the syntax is available, documented, but still it can get complicated. So Microsoft is trying to simplify it by adding AI capabilities to it. For example, let me see if I can bring up the slide. For example, you wanted to see something. You can actually type like in Power BI and Excel. You can ask a question and it gives you report as a result. I am saying show 10 orders from whatever the syntax of that is generated automatically or what you want you do and it syntax. So there was a name called Nitin Parajpe. I edited and made it in Nitin P like we do in flash fill. Something similar happened here and it actually created the behind the scenes syntax. This is using GPT-3 engine. This is a very powerful AI engine which is getting integrated. It is coming extremely soon. Actually, it's released. Already it has been getting released worldwide. It's a part of Power Apps, no extra cost. Next. Can we also load a data set for table template and Power Apps? Yes. Okay, templates, it... templates can be created at Dataverse level or individual Power Apps level, or if you have reusability, then you create Power App components. So another aspect of it is components. We can create components which can be reused across applications so that similar look and feel can be created. So these are called component libraries and you use the same table across multiple applications if you want. Next. Does external user require O365 account to access the apps developed in Power App, which are shared with them? 
Yeah, they require bar apps. Yes, free license at least. Okay, how to integrate these apps in existing application? Maybe non four three sixty five. So if, when you say application, I am assuming you mean data. If the data is on cloud or on premise for both, there are connectors. If it's a custom application and you want that application to appear as a connector, then you can even create a custom connector. OK, how can I write some logic and power apps? Example calculating business days between two dates. Yeah, so there are lots of functions. Uh, I have not gone into the function syntax, but go to the power apps function syntax. It's it, that language even as a name now. But there are all kinds of uh, functions which you can expect. Are available there. I will send you a link. Can we can the app built in tablet layout be responsive with mobile app? Uh, repeat please. Can the app built in tablet layout be responsive with mobile app? No, by default, no. If it's a canvas app, you choose whether it is horizontal or vertical and it will stick to that with little bit of jugglery and additional programming. You can do it, but extra effort is required, not out of the box. Okay. How do we Shesham, handle errors? Wait, Shesham, are you hearing drilling noise? No. Okay. Go ahead. How do we handle errors? Yeah, so error handling is built in. So for example, we saved something, right? So this is a button submit form. Now there are events which have things called on success. So if you see on success is another event on failure is another event. So when you submit something, whether it worked or not, that depends on whether Twitter was successful or SharePoint was successful. So they will generate an error which is handled in the Power Apps infrastructure and wherever there is some activity or action happening with the connector or a data source, it will give you events on success and on failure and then you manage error handling. Next. How much disk space will the app take up in SharePoint? The app itself is going to be basically a structure, so app itself doesn't take space. The data which it stores is what is going to take up space and apps are not stored in SharePoint. They are stored in Azure, but it's a part of Office 365 infrastructure. App doesn't take any space. The data takes space. OK, does Power App require O365 login credentials? Yes. OK, when we create the app on Microsoft Power Apps, does the prospective of trademarking or copywriting cease to exist? What is the IPR point of view when it comes to creating an app on Power Apps? Of course, the app is created by you, so absolutely it is your own IP. Whether it is a app you created, on uh, Power Apps or uh, some data you or a file you put on SharePoint or it is some custom data you have put in Excel. It's absolutely an 100% owned by you, not by Microsoft. Microsoft is not going to look at that data and sell it to someone or use it to send you spam email or use it to show ads to you. That's the whole idea of privacy. You own the data. You control the data. Microsoft can't see it. And exactly what is that? Go to Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. It will give you great details about all the rules and regulations. In simple terms, you own the data. Nobody else can misuse or reuse it without your permission. And even with your permission, still you are the owner. You keep it, you delete it. Uh, does everyone need to have an E1 or an E3 license for consuming application? Some power apps license, even the free one, yes, for consuming. Yes. Even for creating the free version works, but very soon you will hit limits on what you can do in a free version. So if you are serious about it, the currently $40 per person app license is what you should take for creators. For rest of people who are users, a normal even 
Office 365 license will work. I think it works even in the lowest license F1 also. Next. Okay. Do we need to take the approval for MS before publishing? No, no MS is not involved. You purchase the platform from them. You do whatever you want. This is not going into Microsoft's App Store, remember? So basically when you install the Power App on mobile phones of your people, what has happened in the process? You have created an App Store for your organization there. That's the idea. And when you create apps in your environment, that Power Apps is your App Store for your business apps. That's why it is so convenient and dynamic and fast. Next. How will you enforce unique values for username and if the advanced settings read content only created by user is checked? Yeah, so when you create the data itself, that's why data verse kind of thing comes into picture or in Excel, for example, you can't control it. In a SharePoint list, there is an option for unique records only and in any database, there'll be a uniqueness requirement. And in data verse also, there is uniqueness requirement. Now, if really two people have the same name, you'll have to do a validation. At the time of submit, an error will come and you'll have to force the other user to change their name. In a rare case where two people have exactly the same name. OK, so can we integrate MS Power BI app data in SQL Server? Yes, it's a Power BI question, but yes, SQL Server can be on cloud or on premise. If you want to generate reports from on-premise SQL Server in Power BI. You have a Power BI local on-premise version also that's called Power BI Server. If you want to use Power BI on the cloud and SQL Server on-premise, there is a data gateway as well. So all combinations are possible. And that dashboard can be added as a part of Power Apps if you want it that way. Okay, what about validation and how do we make it secure? <laughs> So validations can be local, like I said, it's mandatory or if that field is this and that field is on, but there can be more sophisticated validations also, which are best done as a part of business process flow, which is a part of model apps. Extremely sophisticated business logic can be created there. So you go to a model app and do it from there. It'll take a long time to explain, but just explore model app and then you'll understand. OK, can we have dev UAT and production environment thereby it can be formalized as per yes. organizational development practices? Absolutely, so you can create environments. Test environment should be separate. Production should be separate. For testing, you can create temporary environments which evaporate after 30 days. And then once you are done, you export it, import it into the production environment, use it. Even in the production environment, an application can have multiple versions and you can decide which version is on. If there is a new version which has some problem which was not detected earlier, you can actually go and revert to previous version. All sorts of things are available. So if you go to a application and go to details, there are all kinds of things available, including versions. You can have multiple versions, restore a previous version in case the new one is misbehaving. So yes. OK, can we export to dot APK file and share with outsiders? No. This is not. A true mobile app in the sense of uh, Android or iOS app. The true Android and iOS app is the Power Apps app. That's why you get it in the Android store or uh, iPhone store. Now, once everyone installs Power Apps, that's your app store for your organization. Think of it that way. Next. Um, how can we restrict access to our app created? Yeah, that is absolutely available. Go to Power, Power Apps Admin and you choose who has which license and only give license of creation to people whom you want to create. As simple as that. 
you also don't want people to create a random test and run all that governance is very much available. Power How apps is admin. Sorry. How is this different from Office Forms? Office Forms is a very old technology which is available in say Excel or VBA basically. That doesn't that is essentially on desktop, doesn't work on mobile. There is a JavaScript version also, but it doesn't have all the integration and that 100% requires programming. Next. OK, can we create an app in MS team for a particular private channel? Yes, absolutely. Private channel is still a channel, so everything you can do in a public channel, you can do in a private channel. What is the limitation we have on Power Apps which compares to traditional mobility platforms such as Android Studio or Flutter? I don't see any limitations in that sense at all. Android Studio and stuff are for creating actual apps which go into App Store. This is an App Store by itself, so whatever Power Platform is offering, you create as many apps within Power Apps, there is no limitation whatsoever. OK, I think we've uh, taken up this question before. How can we handle errors in Power Apps? Yeah, it's already covered. The next one is what is environment? Environments, can I create my own environment? Yes, environments is basically a container. You can and you should create. By default, there is a tenant level environment. You can create department level, branch level, group company level. The most common environment may bare minimum people create is test and live. And for testing purpose, like I showed you free of cost, create a developer environment where you play with it. It has a limited lifespan of 30 days. Next. The next one is how to access this app in mobile phone. I already covered that. Install Power Apps, publish the app, use it. The last one that we have for today, do we have to bear the cost for usage of Power Apps in spite of having E3 licenses in? No. Yeah. There is no extra app. So let me just explain licensing in brief. People who create the app need the license. So per user unlimited means what if you pay $40 as of now per month, the user can create unlimited apps and unlimited number of users can use it. Per user per app means what? I create an app and per app I will have to pay this per user. So this generally nobody goes for. It doesn't make sense. If you are seriously creating app. If you are seriously doing this, this is the way to go. And as I said, it is reducing to half on October 1st, 2021. So that's it. Thank you. Bye bye.